well good morning everybody and uh, you all all those who have tuned in uh, just to uh, uh, apprise you that uh, we have here with us uh, professor panish uh, puranam uh, he, actually speaking he requires no uh, you know uh, introduction as such because he's an internationally renowned uh, admission uh, a researcher a scholar an author you know many hats uh, rolled into one and as far as uh, you know all participants and i'm sure our students are concerned he is a perfect uh, you know role model uh, an icon in every respect and especially those who are aspiring to become teachers and researchers well uh, you know he is uh, what i would say as a perfect uh, role model so let us understand why why that is so and let us look at his uh, you know career and uh, achievements uh fanish uh, is roland berger chair professor of strategy and organization design at uh, insead uh he obtained his phd at the wharton school of the university of pennsylvania in 2001 and was on the faculty of uh, london business school till 2012 he served there as school chair professor of strategy and entrepreneurship and co-director of the aditya birla india center Panish has served as the academic director for the PhD program at both uh, London Business School and INSEAD. He has also held visiting position at Northwestern University, University of Pennsylvania, Oxford University, Indian School of Business, and I am Ahmedabad. Uh, Panish's research in organizational science it focuses on how organizations work and how we can make them work better. His current research focuses on how artificial intelligence algorithms are shaping organizational designs. Finish has published his research extensively in internationally reputed academic journals and has served in senior editorial roles in such journals. He has also served in advisory stroke uh, training roles with several global corporations as well as public sector agencies. He has authored several books, including India Insight, which he co-authored with Nirmala Kumar, published in Harvard Business Review Press. It won critical acclaim for its balanced look at the prospect of India emerging as a global hub for innovation. Well, that is a finish for you, a consummate admission, and I'm sure we can look forward to a very, very, uh, you know, uh, interesting lecture, a lecture which I'm sure will be very rich. Uh, in example and in illustration panish you know i have been lucky that i visited uh, insead you know the at chateau the chateau fontainebleau uh, you know a few years back it's a beautiful locale uh, and i'm sure uh, you know uh, perhaps that's one of the reason uh, i won't say uh, you know unfair to say entirely or one of the reasons why it's such a popular you know and famous uh, university in the world so thank you very much Over to you, Finish. You may like to begin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Seth, and thank you, colleagues at uh, JMIS, for inviting me. Uh, yes, I have a long association with your institution, which probably some of you know. Um, uh, Amit was, in fact, uh, one of my seniors from IFT, your chairman, and uh, of course, Professor Ashok Sen Gupta was one of my teachers. So when uh, you reached out to me, and... okay, 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 sir, okay. Ah, sir, I wanted to because some the connection was not there. Uh, thank you, uh, Finish. I, I, you should not start before I tell. Now such I a do. wonderful <laughs> you are here, and I was waiting for my connection with you, and suddenly, thank and you very exactly much for coming. Exactly when I mentioned your name, so that's. And thank you very much for coming, and when I mentioned my name, and uh, I am seeing you after so many years, really. Uh, so I am, I am aged quite quite a lot. I <laughs> have you can see me now. Uh, quite a, 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 a nice group we could have met. now you officially start i wanted this in, uh, unofficial interaction with you as such, such a you know, and you mentioned by name just now okay i will i will start okay thank you very much thank you so much sir a real pleasure to see you again and you don't look a day older than when i saw you by the way you look uh, and, young and, and, hey, 83 years ever. old 83 <laughs> years old now <laughs> thank you age is, age is all you. in the mind age is all in the mind sensor age is exactly. all in the mind exactly so it's a great pleasure to be here yeah, uh, thank, you, me, thank you thank you very much 
share my screen and um, uh, I do have a hard stop in terms of time. So we'll talk for about uh, 50 minutes or so. And then I think I will try and close up a few minutes before time. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about organizing in the metaverse. That's the broad theme of, of my lecture today. And um, the metaverse is one of these buzzwords which has taken over everybody's minds, particularly since Mark Zuckerberg made the announcement in October last year. And it has implications for many things in business. So it has implications for marketing. It has implications for entertainment, of course. It has implications for even particular sectors like real estate, uh, the way that you know real estate will be shown and will be delivered and sold. But my expertise lies in none of those. I'm an expert in how organizations work, right? I'm an organization scientist. And in particular for me, what's interesting about the metaverse is how will it change how we organize? And I'm going to be talking today about the metaverse as a way of thinking about a frontier of distributed work. Okay, that's really the angle that I will take. And uh, this is built on a bunch of ideas which come from many years of work. Uh, I would request, by the way, if you are not asking a question, please mute yourself so that there's no background noise. I can hear something. So please check you're muted. And if not, maybe one of the organizers who can mute everybody except me, they can do that. Thank you. All right. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about what we know about distributed work and then transition on to why the metaverse might have an important implication for how distributed work actually happens or how we organize. Uh, the ideas I'm talking about don't come from just my work. So it's a large team of uh, collaborators, some including former students, some colleagues, some senior professionals in the field. And uh, if you look at where they're located, you can see we are also a very distributed team. So it's kind of an interesting example of a distributed research team spread all around the world itself working on distributed work. So that's, that's a, a meta angle, if you like. And we've been working on this topic for a long time now. I think we first started with Kanan Srikanth, who's up there on the left, uh, and is now a tenured professor at Ohio State University. He was my PhD student at LBS. We were interested in how distributed work happened in the Indian offshoring software development industry. And that was in many ways a pioneer for a lot of what we are seeing today in the space of distributed work. Uh, then I went on to work on open source communities. So I, I really have been very fascinated with software development as a sector for one simple reason. I think what software does today, the rest of knowledge work will do in 10 years. And that includes what you and I do, right? We are all knowledge workers, but we are really 10 years behind what the software industry is doing. So pretty much what they're doing, we will very likely do in about a decade. Uh, so I worked with several colleagues in the open source community. And then more recently, I've been working with uh, uh, the, the two young scholars whose picture is at the top, Marco and uh, Tianyu on distributed work and competitions. So I don't know how many of you have ever participated in a contest run by the platform called Kaggle. Uh, if you haven't, it might be fun to do it, particularly if you have a bit of an interest in programming or data science. So Kaggle hosts these competitions where you can win prize money by competing as a team to crack a data science problem. And what we've done is got data on every competition in Kaggle over a time window and all the teams that participated and tried to get some sense of how these teams, which are mostly distributed teams, how they work together to solve these problems. So the ideas I'm talking about and will summarize today come from a pretty extensive body of research work, much of which is published in the journals that you see here. So if you look under any of our names or mine in these three journals, you will find the uh, papers that I'm referring to, but I'm not going to give you a detailed bibliography here, okay? All right, so what do we mean by distributed work? So I like to call this idea the distribution of distribution. In the sense, just like a statistical distribution, there are many, many possible ways in which work can be distributed. So if on the extreme left, you have a world in which everybody is co-located in one place, right? literally in one room, and that's how many businesses used to be about 100, 150 years ago. And at the other extreme, you have what many of us have been working in this model on the right, particularly after the pandemic hit us, where people are really distributed completely remotely from each other, and still they have to collaboratively work together. These are really two extremes. And I don't think anybody really is seriously thinking that once the pandemic is over, we're all going to stay in this model. Very unlikely, right? Personally, I think it's very unlikely. What's much more likely is that we're going to find some hybrid models in between, okay? Um, so some of these have also been around for a long time. So for instance, multinational companies have always worked like this. 
where they're distributed across different locations. So this is fairly common. It's not at all surprising. And of course, working from home has been a perk or a privilege, or even in some cases, a part of the job package where some people worked in an office, some people work from home, and these could swap over time. So some people could come in, some people could go out. So this is pretty straightforward as well. And I don't think that we are going to see a complete um, move towards fully, fully remote work, but we are going to see a lot of innovation in this space, particularly around hybrid models. And the innovation is going to come, for instance, around questions of who comes in to work when, with whom. So which teams of people come in on Tuesday, which teams come in on Wednesday, how do you form those teams, do those teams churn, do you have to bring them into work, or could they meet in a shared office space somewhere? These are really the questions that everybody is thinking about right now. And I will show you that the metaverse has implications for every one of these questions. Okay? So this is really where I think the action is, where the metaverse connects up with uh, what's happening in this space. Now, before I go further, I also want to point out that we studied a lot of these models of distributed working in quite a lot of depth. And we learned a few things from looking at these different models. Um, the first thing we learned was that if you start with a co-located setup, where everybody is working essentially in the same location, how do you go from that to a distributed setup? And it turns out there are actually just a few ways in which that can happen, okay? So one way which was extremely popular back in the 80s and 90s was what I would call the modularity approach. So what's the idea here? So the modularity approach essentially means take work, which used to be done by people in a very interdependent, closely coordinated fashion, and break it up into fairly autonomous chunks of work. Okay, And if you can do that, then of course it can be done from anywhere. So if you want to think about this idea in action, think about why is it that call centers were among the first business processes to be offshored? And the answer is call centers are the most modular kind of work you can find in the knowledge industry. So every call centers agent is pretty much autonomous. They have very little dependencies between agents. It's mostly solitary work, right? And they also tend to have very little dependencies with the rest of the business. So often before the great offshoring boom happened in the late 90s and 2000, call centers were already located in low wage economies in the Western economies. So in the UK, for example, all the call centers had moved out of London into places like Manchester and Edinburgh uh, already about a decade before offshoring to India happened, right? So what, what is going on here is that if you can take work which used to be done in a very interdependent fashion and break it up into a very modular fashion, then of course it can be distributed anywhere. And that was one approach to solving this problem of distribution. Another approach was what I will call e-interaction. So this is the idea that we can use video conferencing, we can use uh, phone calls, we can use email, we can use text chat, we can use various kinds of um, um, technological means of communication like we're doing right now. We're trying to simulate a face-to-face -face interaction, right? And this is the interaction. Now, of course, for a very long time, this was of very poor quality, right? It's just literally in the last few years that we can count on running these kind of seminars with a high degree of reliability, right? And even today, sometimes we get some glitches, but by and large, it works well today. That wasn't the case even five years ago. So for a long time, most of the interesting action was either here or in a third branch, which our colleagues and I really found really fascinating. And this is what we call tacit coordination. So what do I mean by tacit coordination? So the idea of tacit coordination here is that people can coordinate without talking. Okay, so if you think that sounds like uh, uh, telepathy or, or some kind of mind reading, you're right, you're on the right track. That's exactly what it is. So how does it work? So one of the most telling examples of this we found was when we were studying how offshoring happens in the uh, IT services industry by Indian companies and their clients in the US. And what we discovered was something quite fascinating. The distance between India and the US was always bridged within the offshoring services companies legal boundaries. There was never an overlap between the geographic boundary and the company boundary. What does that mean in plain English? Um, TCS would use its employees sitting in New York to work with its employees in Bangalore. You would almost never get a situation where TCS employees in Bangalore would work with HSBC or Deutsche Bank employees in New York. 
So that geographic distance between India and New York was always kept within the vendor company. Now, why was that? It turns out that because in these companies like TCS, like Wipro, like Infosys, they were literally hiring and training thousands of people, right? And they put them all through the same standardized training program, which means these people had come to share like a common worldview, a common way of looking at the world. They had the same jargon, they had the same training, they used the same technologies, they really understood each other tacitly. So it was almost like telepathy, where you and I might exchange 20 emails to understand something, they could do it in five. Why? Because they could draw on their prior shared training and shared culture within these organizations. So that's what made this approach to tacit coordination so powerful. So we were really impressed with that and we dug into that and studied that very thoroughly and we understood that actually many people think the default if you can't co-locate is to go to e-interaction, but it's not. There are these two other alternatives to try and reprocess the work to make it modular or try to rely on tacit coordination to make things happen. So this is kind of the state of the art of what we knew about distributed work before the COVID pandemic hit, okay? Um, so I want to go back again to my slides to make a couple of additional points here. One is that um, some of the players in this space, which are really worthy of, of looking closely at, uh, I want to mention one in particular. I mentioned the Indian IT services companies. I really think they were pioneers in distributed work. But more recently, just before the pandemic hit, my colleague Marco Minervini and I, uh, we were writing a case on a company called GitLab. So I don't know if you've heard of GitLab. You must have heard of GitHub. Okay. So GitLab is not GitHub. It's a different company. But it also works in the continuous integration software development space. But what's unique about GitLab is not its product. It's the way they're organized. They are 100% distributed, even before the pandemic happened. Right? There were about 1,300 employees in, uh, in November 2019, 1,200 maybe. And no two of them were in the same location. So everybody was working remotely from a different location. So it was one of the first all remote companies to have expanded to that scale. And this, this was something they had already done in 2019 before the pandemic hit. So we started looking quite closely at them as to how they did it. And we discovered, not to our surprise, that mostly they relied on a combination of these two factors. Right? They did not go for the interaction approach at all. In fact, they have a policy in GitLab to do almost zero email. Right? No emails, no video calls, no phone calls. It's all got to be done asynchronously, either through tacit coordination or through modularity. So this is really kind of the cutting edge, if you like, of how distributed work was done at the time the pandemic hit. So this was the state of the art. Now, we did understand that this comes with pros and cons. Okay? This is not surprising. People knew that there are pros and cons to this. So what are the pros of working in this distributed way? Obviously, flexibility. Right? People can balance their work and life much better. They can be at home. They can uh, help out at home, or they can take care of parents or children or spouse, and at the same time also contribute to work in a way that is a lot more flexible than if you had everybody coming in at nine. We've all seen this in the last two years. It's also clear that the moment you can build out your capacity for distributed work, your talent market is no longer restricted to the same postal code. You can source talent from anywhere in the world, right? And I would really point out the effect on sustainability, which often gets ignored. And the idea here is that um, if you think about the average per capita pollution in Western Europe or in the United States, okay, think about tons of carbon per, per person emitted per year, the estimates are that roughly about 50 to 60% of that is commuting and business travel, right? 50 to 60% of the carbon footprint, depending whether you're in the US or in the United or in, in Western Europe is coming just from your business related travel. So obviously if you can move to these distributed ways of working, you're cutting down all of that, right? So that's kind of the hidden argument for distributed work that doesn't get mentioned often enough, but I think it's an extremely important point that you know, every company, whatever its, its CSR ambitions, however much they actually do it or they don't do it, one thing they can do very easily to help the environment is to adopt distributed working, okay? Now, it does come with some costs. So what are these costs? So what's really missing when people are working in these distributed ways is learning from each other, creativity, which comes from random conversations up and down the corridor. The culture of the organization can become very difficult to sustain. Right? Uh, a lot of the reasons why I think most organizations have succeeded in surviving the COVID pandemic is because they could draw on the huge stock of culture they had in the past of people who knew each other, of who had people who had worked in the organization for many years, 
and that became like a form of social capital that they could draw down on during these last two years. But imagine if this continues for the next five and you can only onboard and hire distributed without ever seeing them face to face. Okay, that's a whole different proposition. So people understood the problem that yes, you could do these clever things like tacit coordination and modularity, but you were losing something. You were losing the learning, the creativity, the culture and the networks, right? Uh, so the coffee, coffee uh, machine effect, which you might have heard about, the idea is that what does a coffee machine do in an office? It keeps people caffeinated, of course, but it's also an, a random encounter generator, by which I mean it helps people to find connections with each other at random in the sense it's not dictated by the formal organization design. So people in different departments, different layers, different levels, different genders, different backgrounds will encounter each other next to the coffee machine. Now, why is that important? It's important because no organization design is perfect, right? The purpose of organization design is to get the right set of interactions between people. If no design is perfect, then we need to allow in the system some mechanism for exploring for new interactions. So where does that exploration come from? It comes from the coffee machine. But if there's no coffee machine or things like that, right? By the way, the smokers network is also very powerful. Okay, so there are lots of ways in which you can create these informal networks. I'm not suggesting you take up smoking for that reason. I'm just pointing out there are multiple ways in which these informal networks work. So if you can't get all of that, then obviously you're losing something, right? And people understood this as being part of the problem. That brings us to my first guest speaker of today, which is Mr. Zuckerberg. So let's hear what he has to say about all this. It is time for us to adopt a new company brand to encompass everything that we do. To reflect who we are and what we hope to build, I am proud to announce that starting today, our company is now Meta. Our mission remains the same, it's still about bringing people together. Our apps and their brands, they're not changing either. And we are still the company that designs technology around people. Hey, and welcome to Connect. Today, we're going to talk about the metaverse, starting with the most important experience of all, connecting with people. Imagine you put on your glasses or headset and you're instantly in your home space. It has parts of your physical home recreated virtually, it has things that are only possible virtually, and it has an incredibly inspiring view of whatever you find most beautiful. Hey, are you coming? Yeah, just gotta find something to wear. All right, perfect. Hey, boy. Oh, hey, Mark. Hey, what's going on? Hey, Mark. Hi. Hi, Mark. What's up, Mark? Whoa, we're floating in space? Uh -huh. Who made this place? It's <laughs> awesome. Right? It's from a crater. I met in LA. Uh, this place is amazing. <laughs> Boz, is that you? Of course it's me. You know I had to be the robot, man. <laughs> I thought I was supposed to be the robot. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I knew you were bluffing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wait. Where is Naomi? Let's yes. call her. Naomi. <laughs> hey, should we deal you in? Sorry, I'm running late, but you've got to see what we're checking out. There's an artist going around Soho hiding AR pieces for people to find. 3D street art? That's cool. Send that link over so we can all look at it. This is stunning. Okay, that is something. That's awesome. Wow. Oh, I love the movement. Wait, it's, it's disappearing. This is amazing. Hold on. I'll tip the artist and they'll extend it. Wow. Brilliant. Privacy and safety need to be built into the metaverse. Okay, so I don't think any of us needs a lecture on privacy and safety from Mr. Mark Zuckerberg, but uh, what is he talking about? So the concept of the metaverse is actually not new. The term comes from a novel by Neil Stephenson in 2013. And I think currently the, the definition that we are kind of converging towards, there's no standard definition yet, but this is my attempt at trying to summarize what people are thinking. It's a technological environment that allows immersive co-presence in a bounded virtual space, okay? And this could be mediated through digital representations of the interactors or what we call avatars, right? So clearly there's room for introducing more Indian terms into this, into this space. So we already have avatars. We might have even more. Siddhis is probably coming next. Karma points are already out there. 
So there's a there's an entrepreneurial opportunity here for anybody interested in digging up more ways of connecting uh, ancient Indian terminology to the metaverse. But I'm sure there's lot, lots more to be done. But the basic idea here is that it's a way of creating immersive co-presence. Okay, we are in a in in this meeting right now. We are in a co-presence situation in a bounded virtual environment. Okay, so and you could argue that we are interacting through avatars, right? The image you're seeing is not me; it's an image of me. It's an avatar of me in that sense. It's not an avatar that's trying to cartoonify me, but it is very much a representation. It's not real me, just as it's not real you. But the key difference really is about immersion. Okay, and as you saw from the examples that Zuckerberg was talking about, immersivity really matters. That's what seems to make a very big difference between what, what we have been seeing so far in these technologies of social interaction and the kind of technologies that Facebook is piloting here. Now, that I think means a lot for distributed work because it hits exactly the weakness of current ways of distributed working. So let me explain what I mean by that. So around the time the pandemic hit us, within a, a few months after it happened, I think around March 2020, we launched a survey at INSEAD of our alumni. And our alumni obviously are not representative of, of everybody, but if you're working in knowledge work, I think INSEAD alumni are pretty representative. So we managed to get about 700, nearly 1,000, I think 800 plus responses around the world. And I just want to point out the most interesting insights from that research about what are the positive and negative correlates of self-reported productivity when working from home, okay? So in other words, what are the things that are positively and negatively associated? We don't know if this is causal, this is just a correlational study of what is connected to people saying, I'm likely to be more productive or less productive when working at home. So the first thing I want to point out is what we did not find. Most people thought there's going to be huge variation by industry, right? Some industries have been very badly hit by remote working, some not so much. We didn't find it. And the reason why is very simple. Once you go a couple of levels in the hierarchy above the frontline workers, everybody is doing managerial work. All managerial work is knowledge work. And therefore, the impact of distribution was roughly the same. Right? So what we found in particular quite, quite interesting as to what did matter is that people who are higher in the hierarchical level, people who had previously had experience in working remotely, uh, people who claim this improved their work-life balance, it doesn't do it for everybody. right? For some people, if they don't have enough space at home to work properly, and that could be true for a large part of the workforce, this actually makes things worse, not better. But for those who it did improve work-life balance for, it also improved their productivity. And of course, many people were wasting a lot of time on commuting, and that was gone, right? So all of these were the positive aspects of working from home or correlated positively with successful uh, capacity to work at home. What was negatively correlated or what was depressing productivity at home? And the number one thing was missing social interaction. Okay, Even if work was getting done, this was the really interesting thing. If you just looked at numbers like ROA or numbers like uh, profitability or even attrition or even customer satisfaction, in many cases, even as those numbers remained flat, employee satisfaction really went down. So the missing social interaction part was the piece that people were really flagging here. And of course, you know, not everybody has a nice office at home which means being able to work from an office is in part not for the colleagues, but as a way to escape your family, at least for a few hours in order to concentrate, right? So these were the factors that were coming up very, very clearly. And this is exactly where I think the new functionality that the metaverse is, is uh, allegedly trying to offer meets distributed working. So I'll again let you hear it in Zuckerberg's own words, and you can see where this is likely to go. Just give me a second. Seems to be a glitch here. Let's see. Okay, it's loading up. It is time for us to adopt 
a new I'll company to brand to encompass everything from home using the metaverse. While I miss seeing the people I work with, I think remote work is here to stay for a lot of people. So we're going to need better tools to work together. Let's take a look at what working in the metaverse will be like. Imagine if you could be at the office without the commute. You would still have that sense of presence, shared physical space, those chance interactions that make your day all accessible from anywhere. Now imagine that you have your perfect work setup and you can actually do more than you could in your regular work setup. And on top of all that, you can keep wearing your favorite sweatpants. And as we focused more on work, and frankly, as we've heard your feedback more broadly, we're working on making it so you can log into Quest with an account other than your personal Facebook account. We're starting to test support for work accounts soon, and we're working on making a broader shift here within the next year. I know this is a big deal for a lot of people. Not everyone wants their social media profile linked to all these other experiences, and I get that, especially as the metaverse expands. And I'll share more about that later. But I'm genuinely optimistic about work in the metaverse. We know from the last couple of years that a lot of people can effectively work from anywhere. But hybrid is going to be a lot more complex when some people are together and others are still remote. So giving everyone the tools to be present, no matter where they are, whether as a hologram sitting next to you in a physical meeting or in a discussion taking place in the metaverse, that's going to be a game changer. I think this could be very positive for our society and economy. Giving people access to jobs in more places, no matter where they live, will be a big deal for spreading opportunity to more people. Dropping our daily commutes will mean less time stuck in traffic and more time doing things that matter. And it'll be good for the environment. Okay, so as you can see, he's essentially pitching the same arguments for the metaverse that people historically have been pitching for um, distributed work. Right? The two arguments have really converged. So everything you see here on this page is exactly the same set of things that he's mentioning as well. So the arguments about the advantage of the metaverse versus the uh, advantages of distributed working have sort of come together. And people are now really talking about using one as a version of the other. Now, you might say that you know the examples that you just saw, and this is like the best examples that money can buy. Right? So Mark Zuckerberg and his team have put money into coming up with these examples. They still look very cartoony. This looks like something for kids, right? Would adults really want to work in an environment that looks so cartoonified? Um, I think the answer to that question has two parts, and I want to walk you through both of them. So the first part of the answer really is, a lot depends really on how immersive is immersive, okay? So right now it's not, it's not very immersive. So yes, we are here talking through Zoom and I'm, I'm hopefully being interesting enough that you're all immersed, but I know that regardless of how interesting I am, if there are distractions in your neighborhood or something important happens, you know that you are not here in this room with me, okay? But if we get to a point where the technologies allow us to strap on these uh, Oculus type headsets and we are in these virt virtual realities or mixed realities with artificial and real uh, components in there, the experience might become a lot more immersive, okay? And just imagine if we take that argument a step forward, suppose it became so immersive that you could no longer tell it from reality. Okay. This is what people are really aiming to produce. This is really the gold standard. So in every industry, there is like the gold standard. So in the world of AI, where I also do a lot of my research currently, the gold standard is to create human-grade intelligence, right? artificial general AI. It's very far away. We are not even close right now. In the world of metaverse, the gold standard is, can we get to a level of immersivity where you can no longer tell if you are in the metaverse or you are in base reality? Okay. And some people have actually argued, how do you know that hasn't already happened? Okay, It's a very interesting argument by an Oxford philosopher called Nick Bostrom, who says, actually, there is no way to prove that we don't all already live in a simulation. Okay, um, So while you're processing that, I'm not going to get all philosophical on you right now. This is not the point of today's talk. The point is, let's assume for now that we are living in base reality. Okay, And even if we are not, everything I say will still matter. Because whatever level of reality we are in now, the metaverse clearly is one level of unreality above that, right? So even if you're not at base reality, so it doesn't really matter. What we might ask ourselves in a very pragmatic way is what is truly different about interactions in base reality, in base R, right? Or as some of the kids nowadays call it, meet space. 
So what is truly different about interactions in base R versus in the metaverse? Um, firstly, it's nonverbal cues, it's body language, right? So I've noticed, for instance, that when I'm teaching, it's much better for me to stand up like this in front of a board. So you can see my hands, right? So I, I, I talk with my hands, not as much as some of my Italian friends do, but to some extent. So the fact that you can see my hands, you can see my entire body and how I'm moving and walking, this conveys information. And that information could be lost when we are not in a physical internet environment. So a good metaphors design would have to find ways of conveying this. This is important. There's more authentic self-presentation in person, right? So I'm not hiding behind a cartoon avatar. Uh, even that has become a bit of a gray zone. So think about Zoom and think about all the features Zoom has added in the last one year to do automatic makeup, for example, right? So you can touch up your face if you haven't already discovered that. So as I've discovered, many colleagues I've never met in, in, in person only seem on Zoom. When I actually see them, they turn out to be somewhat less attractive than they were on Zoom. And that might have something to do with the makeup feature that Zoom has built into the system. So authentic self-presentation is obviously a, a variable that currently tips in face of in, in, in the direction of base reality. But if the metaverse gets really good, maybe it'll be able to compensate for that as well. Shared context, this is really probably the most important thing that the metaverse can do and is already beginning to do. It's not just enough that I can see you, but I can see you in an avatar that looks real enough. What's important is for us to be jointly present in a shared context, where when I pick up a pen and I put it in front of you, you should be able to pick it up as well. That shared context is really, and one version of which we already have today is things like Google Doc. So when you open a Google Doc and I open a Google Doc and we are both writing on it, we are modifying the same physical reality even though we are sitting in completely different places, okay? The, the Miro Blackboard does the same thing. We can both draw on the same Blackboard at the same time. But imagine you can go beyond drawing and writing to actually affecting things in your game environment. That's what shared context is all about. And this is what we take for granted in reality, in base reality, but not necessarily in the metaverse. The opportunity for touch, right? I don't necessarily mean in a romantic sense or in a sexual sense or anything. Just the fact that you know friends are in one physical space means you can shake hands, you can tap somebody on the shoulder, touch their face. There are many things we can do, we take for granted, which are not possible in the metaverse as of today and many, many more. There are some things which are actually much more simpler to replicate even today in the metaverse without waiting for any technological progress. One of the big advantages of face-to-face -face meetings is nothing we do in the face-to-face -face meeting, but the fact that there is no time limit, right? So when we sit down in the office and start chatting face-to-face, -face, it's not that I'm reaching out and touching you or you're looking at my body language or I'm you know, wearing makeup or not wearing makeup. The real difference might lie in the fact that the time we spend is unstructured. There's not necessarily a scheduled one hour or 30 minutes. Usually there is, but in the real world, we often let things go over the boundary and that's fine. But we can recreate that, right? So many of our colleagues actually that I work with now, we have kind of this open hour type sessions where we don't have a fixed time and we just drop out of the call when we have to do other things. And we find this quite useful, particularly for brainstorming or thinking about new ideas. The structured 30 minute meeting doesn't do it. Right? But you can replicate this. And in the world of business in particular, I think one of the things that the metaverse has to compete with is the signal of commitment. The fact that you got on this plane and took this journey and did all the paperwork on both sides for COVID and passports and visas is like a huge signal of commitment from you. Okay, If you can't be bothered to do that, you just want to call me on Zoom, should I take you seriously as a business partner? So that's almost like uh, uh, the value of reality is not that you're really there, it's that it's so inconvenient to do it in the real world that the fact you're doing it is a signal of how serious you are. Okay. Again, these are things that one can work around, I think. But a lot of the other stuff, particularly around the nonverbal cues, the authentic self-presentation, the shared context, opportunity for touch, we don't have it yet. The metaverse technology is not there today. They claim they're working on it. I don't know how fast it'll, it'll uh, develop. And in particular, whether it'll develop fast enough to spread broadly enough to affect most people. It might be niche applications, but for the most part, these are still very, very niche applications. So I do want to point out though, that from this list, if you come away with the conclusion that, okay, the metaverse is some interesting toy-like thing for some people to play video games or entertain themselves, but surely it's not going to have an effect on mainstream organizations and how they work. Then I have one very important caveat to point out. Okay, and that's this. Can you guess what you're looking at here? 
this is a stadium full of people watching esports okay so what are esports esports are where teams of players play video games for huge amounts of cash there's a lot of prize money involved so this is in particular a, a esport event around a game called dota 2 which is organized by the company wall out of seattle uh, this is very big in in southeast asia by the way where i live in singapore it's also quite big in eastern europe i don't know how big it has become in india still but the point i'm trying to make is that there is a generation right and it's not just gen z it's also gen alpha which is coming next for whom immersive multiplayer online gaming is extremely natural there are kids now who are in their teens who have made friends i'm absolutely sure of it with people they have never met in the real world and they will become close friends with such people and they'll maintain these relationships going forward these are called gen alpha right the people born after 2010 so after gen z we now have gen alpha so between the gen z late comers and the gen alpha once they enter the workforce a lot of the skepticism we have about will people be happy interacting in this artificial way using avatars will simply go away because they know how to do it and they've been used to doing it right this is one of the reasons if you ask me to bet which company is more likely to eventually succeed in the metaverse i would put my money on sony and microsoft not on facebook because they are the masters of gaming and they already have this captive audience in place. So they truly understand how to get social interaction in a virtual bounded uh, environment with a very immersive experience. That's exactly what these games are. Okay. So let me wrap up my, my formal part of the, the lecture here by just summarizing a few conclusions. So in the short term, I think metaverse applications can help bridge some of the missing social interaction of distributed work because distributed work is here to stay, right? So very soon, uh, distributed work will just be work. There'll be no separate term for it. But even though it will be work, it will continue to miss a lot of the spontaneous social interaction that we take for granted when people work co-located. And metaverse applications can help bridge some of that. So employee onboarding, team building, brainstorming, the random encounter generator. So what the coffee machine used to do, video gaming might now do, right? So these are ways in which the in the short term, we can see metaverse applications uh, helping to fill in some of these gaps in terms of missing social interaction within organizations, at least in the short term. Now, all of this is very much about organizing, which is the focus of my talk. There's a ton of other metaverse applications on marketing, e-commerce, real estate, entertainment, and so on, uh, which I'm not qualified to talk about, but you know, it seems pretty obvious what's going to happen there. right? So if you can show people a, a, a show home, or you can show people a car, or you can help them do shopping in a grocery, all without leaving the comfort of their home, yeah, that's a fantastic commerce application. So that's pretty obvious in my view. So I'm more interested in how it changes the way we organize. And I think in the short term, it's all of these things. But in the longer term, not only will distributed work just be the norm, this will be effectively the baseline. It's also going to be the case that we'll have a new breed of employees. So this is the Gen Z and Gen Alpha. By the time they enter the workforce, they'll be metaverse natives. Okay, For them, this is natural. This is how it works. They're used to working in virtual environments with people they've never interacted before. And I'll hazard a guess, I'm not sure. They might even be completely indifferent to base R, base reality, versus metaverse interactions for work and for play, right? Which means a lot of what we are currently struggling with in the distributed working environment might be resolved effectively through these technologies like the metaverse. So let me stop there. And I think I have time to take about 10 minutes of questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for such an inf insightful lecture. The lecture was very profound and comprehensive in the field of metaverse. And how about its emergence of the metaverse as the next frontier virtual reality? As we know that the big push to metaverse came from the COVID-19 pandemic, given the compulsions of remote work and online education and the growing importance of the digital world in the economies to make the virtual world as real as possible. Thanks a lot, sir, for sharing your valuable time and knowledge with our students and faculty members and the other guests. We have some questions from our audience, if you allow. May I please ask, sir? Of course, please go ahead. Uh, the first question we have uh, with us from Dr. Akhil Bustrai, sir. He has mm -hmm. asked that in early 2000, we have to witness second life, which too had avatars. How is meta different from that? Very good question. So by the way, Second Life is still around. I don't know if any of you have tried playing it recently. 
So this is my second attempt to get a meta, to get a second life account. I got one as a doctoral student, I remember. Uh, the big difference between second life and this is really just immersivity. That's it, right? So the main difference really is the headset. So imagine second life, but where you are wearing a headset so that you feel you are inside as opposed to you can see your avatar walking. This is essentially what, what the metaverse is really trying to do. Everything else that you see in Second Life is also likely to unfold in what's now called the Metaverse. Thank you, sir, for answering this question. We have another question from Dr. Rakhil Bistray, sir. Uh, will immersive interaction delineate a young generation from human contact? If so, it may have serious social implications in time to come. I think so. So I would completely agree with that. I would draw the line between saying, is the social implication positive or negative? I don't know. So here's the reason why. We are all used to a current model of how children work and go to school and play. And in some sense, that model is natural because it grooms them to then become adults and work and play in a social context, which is a lot like their childhood play. Right? They have to get along with a bunch of different people. They have to know how to make friends, work with people they don't like so much, resolve their disputes. So you can think of play as training for work. That's not the only reason. Play is also for fun, right? But play has an important role, I think, in training for future life. But suppose your future life will be online. Then maybe online gaming is the best training for it. Right? So the point I'm really trying to make is that the nature of play, particularly the video gaming uh, epidemic, which has, which has raged through the world, certainly has some negatives. You know, I've been annoyed with my kids for spending too much time on video games. But I also asked myself, is he perhaps picking up some important skills on how to build friends and form teams and work together as a team with people you've never seen face to face? Because that's what he's doing in a lot of these multiplayer online games. And that's exactly what we're talking about here, right? With the metaverse and distributed working. So I think there are both sides to this. It's too early to tell what the net effect is. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, we have some more questions. Uh, how specifically organizations are building the economic foundation of the meta universe? So this is a complicated question because it depends on what's your role in this, in this space, right? So if you're one of the big tech companies, like if you're a, a networking company or you're a virtual reality company or you're a content company, then this is going to be a core business platform for you. And you're going to be spending billions and billions of dollars on this. Uh, good news for our Indian IT companies, by the way, all of them know that they're going to be getting a huge amount of outsourced contract work, building out the technology and the software platforms for metaverse applications everywhere, right? But that's one part of the economy. The other part is most ordinary companies, by which I mean, including organizations like your institute and mine. So we are in the education business, right? That's what we are in. So we will have a metaverse application, something like an enhanced second life in which we will be delivering a lot of our classes, as will you, I'm very sure, right? Now, who's going to build that for us? So we are not experts in IT or in building the Metaverse platform, so we're going to outsource it. So this will be a different class of investment where organizations like yours and mine, and for that matter, Unilever and PNG, will be investing in getting experts to help build Metaverse applications for them, right? There'll be a third class of applications, which is about Metaverse applications for employees. So how to onboard them, how to do team building, how to do training internally. Again, INSEAD is not a technology company. So nor is I'm assuming JMS, right? So you guys and we are going to go out and hire experts who will build these platforms, or there might even be standardized platforms that all business schools adopt, just like LMS. So you can think of this as another version of an LMS. So I see all these different ways in which our investments into the metaverse will go. But uh, what, what seems clear is that if you are in any way dealing with large scale social interaction, either among your customers or with your customers or among your employees, you'll be making some investment, right? There's no way not to be making it. Thank you so much sir, for answer, answering this question. We have another one, which is the last question. How Metaverse will transform influencer marketing in the upcoming years? Uh, that's an interesting question. I honestly don't know the answer to that, right? For sure, I think there will be a, a generation for whom social media is metaverse media. That's not me, right? And that's probably not my son either. But if you think about those, my son is 18 now. But if you think about kids born after 2005, after 2010, let's say, and certainly the next generation coming after 2015 or so, for them, their exposure to social media will be through metaverse-like applications. 
So of course, in that world, their key influencers are also going to be acting through the metaverse using their avatars and their icons. So it's extremely likely, I think, that just as a significant chunk of social media interactions will move to metaverse-like applications, so will influencers. That's bound to happen, I think. Thanks a lot, sir. Thanks a lot. And thank you for uh, delivering such an insightful session. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Amit Gupta, Chairman James, to deliver a word of thanks. Sir is a visionary who motivates us, guides us, and shows the path for growth. Dr. Amit Gupta, Chairman, Jagannath International Management School, is a nationally renowned educationist, an outstanding scholar, iconic entrepreneur, and a philanthropist. Inspired by the ideal of making education meaningful to the times, he laid the foundation of GEMS Group, a modern, professionally run education group, three decades back. The group has since established eight higher education institutes and two private state universities in the states of Delhi, Haryana, UP, and Rajasthan. May I please invite you, sir, to deliver a word of thanks? Well, thank you, Shilpi, for your kind words. And it's a real pleasure to see Professor Fanish after so many years. Uh, I still remember our old days when we were studying together at Indian Institute of Foreign Trade, and I used to take some informal help and guidance from Fanish for our journal ATEM. And Professor Fanish, I'm proud to share with you that now ATEM is in the Scopus and the Web of Science list, and it is now rated as one of the most reputed journals published by a management institution in Delhi. Well, uh, to be honest, Professor Fanish, I missed out the few first few minutes of your lecture, but whatever I could hear in the last half an hour, I'm still proud to say that you're one of the most clear-headed academicians I have ever met. You were always clear in your thought process when you were a student. You're one of the brightest students I could remember in IFT. And I'm really happy to say that you've shared your experience with our students in a most grounded and a clear fashion. That's what's important that the students should understand what you're talking about. So metaverse is something which all of us have to live with in the next few years. Fortunately, my son, whom you also met a few years ago, is also in the same, you know, now he's in his college life. And I was talking to him yesterday and he also mentioned that how metaverse is going to influence, you know, everyone's life. So I guess the kids are smarter than us today. And I'm really happy to say that our students have learned a little bit more today. And I just hope that gyms and all other educational institutions do something more on this front and try and seek help from other organizations, IT companies, but try and imbibe this in our education delivery system. It's very, very important. Thank you once again, Professor Fanish. I really look forward to meeting you in Delhi. Whenever you visit India, please let us know. And it was a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amit. Thank you, Dr. Senbukta. Thank you, Dr. Seth. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. With this, we come to the end of our third distinguished lecture series in this series. James Kalkaji thanks group institutions, directors, faculty members, our chief guests, and alumni. Appreciates our honorable guest for taking out valuable time from the busy schedule. I would like to thank all the participants for being here with such an amazing audience and those who are here on live streaming on YouTube. Thank you all to be, uh, for being here today. We are closing the session now. Yeah, okay.